This video has been sponsored by Squarespace and Magic Spoon. These rustics are so inept. Brandon, are you okay? What did you just say to me? I asked if you- Work this land as free men. Free men. Free men. Free men. Free men. Come on, come on, come on, come on, please. Brandon, please, just tell me what's going on. I'm sorry, I just, I have to, I have to get out of here. I have to go. Okay, Horatio. We'll be... I, I think we'll be safe here. Wouldst thou like to live patriotically? <laughs> Horatio, I think, I think it was only a dream, oh, only a dream. Tell me about Ohio! Ah! What? What? What do you want from me? I Begin making the Patriot Part 3 review! What? What? Yeah, dude, it's been... It's been uh, over a year since the last part. That's uh... It's a new low, even for you. Oh, oh. Yeah, you remember when I made a video responding to your Patriot video? Well, that was Part 0, and that was literally years ago, dude. That was before COVID. Fuck. But I've been, I mean, I've been busy. I've been traveling. Yeah, I've been traveling. I've been, fuck you, Brandon. Fuck you. Come on, Patriot part three, let's go. All right, right. I'll, uh, I'll get on that. This fucking guy. <gasps> Right, well, that was, um, different, but you know how it all goes. Uh, ages come and pass, memory becomes legend, but at long last, my friends, here we are returned to the horror, to the terror that is the Patriot, and in particular, this. Well, today we're going to be going over that infernal, that infamous ambush scene from The Patriots in which Mel Gibson single-handedly slaughters an entire company of British regular soldiers. And, um, well, yes, there are, there are a lot of topics in this film that are arguably more important to talk about. Um, still, I think this scene establishes a great number of very important and, and horrendously inaccurate, um, facts, quote-unquote, uh, about the British Army um, in the minds of the audience going forward, and for that reason, it is still very important to talk about not only from a strictly, you know, historical inaccuracy, you know, pedantry type view, uh, but also on a more, shall we say, filmmaking and uh, moralistic point of view. So grab a flintlocker five and follow me, because we are going to unrepentantly war crime this scene piece by piece until there is nothing left.
This video is brought to you in part by magicspoon.com forward slash Brandon FBF. Those of you who don't know me personally may be a little surprised to hear this, but, um, well, I admit, I can be just a smidge bit pretentious. But for those who also know me personally, you'll know that my diet is pretty much that of a child. I really enjoy, like, my fancy wine glasses. This is apple juice. And then my idea of making dinner is usually no more sophisticated than, uh, well, a certain blue box and uh, some chicken nuggets, tendies as they call it on the internet. So naturally, the boxes of sugar, fat, and an early grave that we call breakfast cereal in this country uh, has always been pretty high on my list of vittles. Well, Magic Spoon is trying to change that. Every serving of their cereal has zero grams of sugar, between 13 and 14 grams of protein, only four net grams of carbs, and is 140 calories. It is keto-friendly, whatever that means, gluten-free, um, grain-free, soy-free, and even low-carb. Um, and when I first heard all of that, I'll tell you what I thought. That sounds awful. But somehow, despite all of the health mumbo jumbo, it's not actually mumbo jumbo, that's only for a joke, please take care of yourself, still, they managed to make a pretty good cereal. Anyways, I'm supposed to pick one of these lovely favors as my flavor, as my favorite, as my favorite, um, but I'm not gonna do that, because instead, because after trying all of them, I had an amazing idea. And this is the sort of thing I think that they should maybe, uh, uh, hire me on a little bit more permanently for because I was going to say it's, it's, uh, it's a pretty good one. Um, so I combined, see I took, gotta love that crinkly noise, I guess it's an ASMR channel now, but I combined the cocoa. That bag was more full than I remember. Well, they, they really stuff them full. I got cereal everywhere. Oh, oh well, oh dear. And I combined the cocoa and the peanut butter bits. Oh dear. Which, as soon as you open this bag, you really do. You get a, a, a very strong smell of peanut butter. Mix some of that in there, and then what you do, you mix that up a little bit. Yes, I eat my cereal dry because well, I'm a barbarian, I suppose. And then, there you go. It tastes an awful lot like, you know, that kind of cereal, but unlike you know, that name brand of cereal that we all know the name of. And unlike that name brand, because there's something in it other than just pure sugar, you don't have to feel quite so guilty for enjoying it. So if you'd like to give it a try, then I recommend that you do so soon, because Magic Spoon has a special going on for Black Friday. It's a little awkward with the eating and the recording, but you know, for food, so it fits. <laughs> um, Yes, a full uh, a Black Friday sale for a full 20% off when you use my code BRANDONFBF or visit uh, magicspoon.com forward slash BRANDONFBF. I feel like I'm showing you. I feel like I'm showing you a mouthful of food right now. Oh, well, it's kind of lost cause. Um, again, uh, just by visiting the special URL, magicspoon.com forward slash BRANDONFBF. Uh, and hey, if for whatever odd reason you do not fully enjoy the stuff, uh, they have a full money back guarantee, so it's really no risk to you. Um, and also, they're now shipping to Canada and the UK, so my good old Anglosphere friend, is America part of the Anglosphere? Kind of sort of. Anyways, the old Dominion and, 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 and the old country, uh, feel free, you can, you can get cereal as well. Thank you very much to Magic Spoon for sponsoring this video. It's a surprise that they allow me to do this sort of thing. And uh, now back to the topic at hand. Now, in case you've not seen this film before or any of my previous reviews, here's a little bit of quick context for that which we are about to witness. Heaven help us. Mel Gibson's son, the Joker, had enlisted in the Continental Army and was assigned as a dispatch rider. After being wounded and finding his way back to his father's estate, he was captured by government forces who intend to hang him as a spy for some reason? It doesn't really make any sense. I talk about it at length in my previous review video. Anyways, the British go full General Plan Ost on the place, and for some reason they're taking Ennis Del Mar with them to be hanged, rather than just executing him on the spot like they are murdering everyone else. I guess to serve as an example? But, as it turns out, Mel Gibson is actually a super soldier who's feeling a little bit upset at the prospect of losing another son, so he takes his other kids along for the ride to free him. They camp out in the woods along the route that they somehow know this company of soldiers is going to be marching in order to ambush them. 
And that right there is a pretty, pretty nice place to start off. Why are there so few men actually guarding this prisoner, escorting this convoy? I mean, it's not like he demands a, a massive guard, yes, but where are all of the other soldiers going? Now, I'll talk about all this in greater depth in a future video because there is a lot to say about this mess of a scene, uh, but by my count, there are numerous companies of men all descending on this farmhouse. Like, I'm thinking they could even be a full battalion. It's that ridiculous. Where do all of these guys go? Like, why does the army suddenly split up to where only like 20 something soldiers are defending this prisoner with two wagons worth of supplies? They felt the need to send an entire battalion to burn some random farmhouse, but now they only need a single company that's at half strength, incidentally, uh, or even less, depending on what year we're talking about exactly. The regulations change and whatnot, but uh, only, you know, this like very paltry little band of guys to defend this two wagons worth of supplies and a prisoner both. I mean, I know that they just beat the rebel army the night before, but they're still marching through enemy territory here. I mean, technically, they're all marching with bayonets fixed and everything. Presumably, they expect that something might happen to them. Uh, what if a group of rebels happens to reform in the middle of the night and, you know, were camped out somewhere nearby? What if there's a band of militia? What, you know, any number of things could happen here to where you might want to send more than just 20 guys to pretend that protect this two wagons worth of supplies and the person who you're accusing of being a spy. You know, what if literally anyone saw that giant pillar of smoke rising through the air and decided to go and stop by, check out, see what's going on, like, I don't know, all the local townsmen or something. They probably brought their firelocks with them, they're expecting some sort of trouble. There are all sorts of scenarios that are easily imaginable where this little band could be rapidly overrun, lose the supplies, and the prisoner. Now, there is one exception to this. Maybe they're not actually passing through enemy territory. Maybe they're going back through land that the army has already gone through and that has already been secured. But then, where is everyone else going? I mean, I guess, yes, that the main force could just keep on going down the road to war crime more folks along the way, but, but what about all the wounded men that they just recovered? I mean, they're gonna have to be sent back to an encampment or back to a town, and presumably that's going to be going in the opposite direction, the same direction that the supplies and the prisoner are gonna be brought along. So where did they all go? Are they taking a different road? Uh, are they being sent to a different camp? Why? And even if they are taking a different road and the main force is carrying on in yet another direction, it's not like they're gonna be all too far away before the battle we're about to discuss even begins. There's no way that nobody would hear the distant gunfire when Gibson starts this ambush, to say nothing of all the shouting and such. And yet, nobody goes over to just check it out? See maybe what's going on? Someone like, I don't know, a, a troop of light cavalry whose specific job it is to scout around the column and protect it from ambushes like this one? Well, for whatever odd reason, we just have to accept that there's only 22 men and no reinforcements show up. Of course, given the uh, logic, if you can call that, of this film, I doubt it would really matter if even King George himself showed up with an entire army. Mel Gibson would have slaughtered them all to the delight of a million boomers. <laughs> So the ambush begins, and there's one big thing that I want you to note through it all, and that is the incompetency, the stupidity, and the fragility of the soldiers in this scene. Immediately on the first shot being fired, the soldiers begin to just panic. Now, initial surprise is understandable, and to be expected even. I mean, this is an ambush. But what we see here is a total breakdown. There is nearly no coordination between the soldiers. Nothing they do makes any level of sense. Their drill just completely falls apart, although it's kind of a mess through the entire film, to be fair. And most importantly, they don't hit a single thing, even at this incredibly close range. And then every one of them, whether they get shot or stabbed or even just knocked aside, only really needs one blow to be completely taken out of action. They're not even walking wounded. They're just gone, whether they're unconscious or dead, right off the bat. They are continuously being outsmarted and manhandled with such ease that you'd think that they're a bunch of YouTubers pretending to be soldiers rather than hardened professionals and the veterans of numerous battles, including one like literally the night before. Remember that this scene is taking place during 1780, during Cornwallis' southern campaign. 
Odds are that these guys, regardless of what regiment they're from, and oh god, I could talk about that horrible uniform distinctions, but anyways, regardless of what regiment they're supposed to be from, odds are that these guys have been in America for a long time. Alongside these guys having experienced multiple battles, they've also seen some of the harshest campaigning of the entire war. These are the same soldiers who would on numerous occasions during that campaign and many others march like all night, get practically zero sleep, and then fight a battle the next morning and still manage to win. Suffice to say, the British Army at this period of the war, and especially in this region of the war, they're renowned for their speed on the battlefield, the accuracy of their, of their fire, and the ferocity, this is the important one, the ferocity of their charge with the bayonet. Now you'd think that a filmmaker, if they had any ounce of intelligence, would be able to use that to their advantage in creating their antagonist. Villains need to be competent for an audience to be scared of them, to believe that they are a credible threat to the protagonist for any actual sense of tension to exist. But instead what we get here amounts to little more honestly than just murder porn because the baddies, or so-called baddies, are just so horribly incompetent. And this scene is only the second time that we really get a good look in the film at how the British army is operating. The first scene is them acting like drones. They're mindlessly following orders to murder wounded men, and here in the second, we're seeing them as terrified incompetents without any semblance of initiative. And this is the enemy of the Patriot, not a battle-hardened veteran force that actually poses a threat to the hero. Hero? No, 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 that'd be too difficult to write. It wouldn't be uh, sexually gratifying enough for the don't tread on me fetishists. Uh, instead, the British army of this film is basically made up of battle droids. Open fire. The only real difference between the two is that the soldiers don't have a cool futuristic aesthetic, but do you know what does is that new website that you just built using squarespace.com forward slash brand and F. That's right, we've entered sponsor territory and this video is brought to you in part by Squarespace dot com slash Brandon F. Man, I am amazing at segues. In today's world, there are countless reasons why you might need a website, whether it's selling your novel, promoting your YouTube channel, or even trying to find recruits for your reenactment group because the last batch just got slaughtered by a protagonist. A sleek, well-designed, and up-to-date website, reenactors, I'm talking to you here, goes an extraordinary way towards helping you come across as the professional that you ought to be. And with Squarespace, it's never been easier to have that modern online presence, even for those of us who are, um, technologically challenged reenactors. Using their all-in-one platform, not only can you create a sleek and beautiful website by using their templates, but you can promote it too by using Squarespace's marketing and analytical tools to find your audience. But just locating that audience is really only half the battle. You also need to retain that audience and engage them. Well, that too is made easy with Squarespace, which has all sorts of features like members-only sections and email campaigns, providing people with reasons to consistently come back and spend time on your website with exclusive content and regular updates. And once you really start to locate and hone in on that audience, Squarespace makes it easy for them to help promote your content with all sorts of social sharing tools, bringing you to a wider audience on Facebook, on Twitter, Reddit, all the rest. So for whatever you're up to lately, from business ventures to passion projects, make it into something professional and modern. Head over to squarespace.com slash brandsandf where you can get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain after trying out their service with a trial to see if it's right for you. Thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring this video, and now back to it. So let's do some play-by-play. -play. Boom! The battle begins with Gibson taking a shot which sends an officer comically flying through the air. It's wonderfully convenient for Gibson that the smoke of his firelock dissipates almost immediately and that none of the soldiers seem to be wearing their glasses that day because even with most of them immediately looking in his direction, not a one happens to spot the man. Instead, we actually hear someone crying out, on the right, on the right, even though literally nothing that happened indicated any threat from that direction. 
the officer that got blasted flew off his horse to the right, making it laughably obvious that the shot came from the left. Meanwhile, realistically, you would still have at least a little bit of remaining smoke sizzling through the air exactly where that shot came from. Anyways, despite the fact that these soldiers are alert now and are all looking pretty much exactly at the spot where the guy is hiding, he still manages to jump off despite the fact that he has zero covering fire and there's nothing distracting the soldiers from where he was to another point of cover. Meanwhile, as more guns go off, we get this shot of an officer who has clearly been paying no attention whatsoever. You'd think that when your superior is killed that you'd have some sort of reaction, uh, whether it's, you know, competently, as you should, taking command and beginning to assess your situation, issuing orders and whatnot, or even if it's just being stunned into inaction, maybe it's the less professional thing to do, scared, being, being surprised, something. But instead, this guy just seems pretty unperturbed that he's just got shot. Meanwhile, as all the troops are really taking their time to reload, the second kid kills one of the regulars, again with perfect accuracy. Finally, the regulars, all again experienced veteran adult soldiers, return a ragged looking volley, and of course they don't hit a thing. Look at this guy, he actually pulls the trigger like down here, down at his chest. I mean, I've been burned by, by a musket flash before that was a little bit too close, like the back of my head before. I mean, yikes, that, that's gotta hurt. So the command comes to form ranks in little more than a conversational tone, and it's no surprise that only the men in the immediate vicinity of whoever called it out actually follow the order. And so, naturally, uh, the British here are fighting an irregular combat against an unknown number of enemies uh, who are in a superior position to them, uh, and they're doing so with themselves, presumably at least a relatively small number of men. They don't know they're only going up against three guys. So, um, what do they do? Well, they form into close order, shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder formation. Why not form in, in open order, leaving more space between each individual man, and then have the soldiers start firing by files? Uh, firing by files is basically to where, you know, one man will always be loaded while the other guy, his file partner, is busy reloading. So, you know, once he's finished reloading, the man in front, he'll take his shot, and then the guy who's waiting will keep there with, with his musket fully loaded while the other guy is reloading his piece. The entire idea is, you want, at, at all times, you want at least half of the formation ready to fire, you know, all nice and loaded. And that sort of thing is valuable in a few situations. If, say, for example, there's an enemy that might charge you at any moment, but you don't know when, well, great. So uh, you're exchanging fire with them consistently, but also at any point you have half of your guys loaded and ready to go in case the enemy formation does charge. Or, for example, if you're fighting enemies who are using cover exactly like we have here, well great, you're able to be laying on that suppressive fire, but then the minute they pop their heads up, bang, you have at least half the formation ready to go. Why don't they do something like that? Well, I know why, because the creators of the film were kind of clueless as to what the British Army actually did. So there darts Gibson, again exposing himself as an incredibly obvious target if literally any of the soldiers had eyes or were paying attention in the slightest. God, and isn't it just so perfect that the men are falling in at the shoulder too? Like, you're actively being fired on. Get those muskets up to the recover so you're ready to actually shoot the things. Why are they even firing by individual commands like this? Make ready, present, and fire. What are you doing with the volleys? It's nonsensical. Again, fire independently by files or you're just letting your enemy run circles around you. So while the Brits are busy forming these nonsensical ranks, Gibson's able to pull off another shot with a level of accuracy achievable only by the Call of Duty player that's having relations with my mother. Oh God. Mate, if I ever see you, I'm gonna fucking slip your fucking face right over you. Kill confirmed. All without the British spotting the target or the blast of smoke from the musket, let alone even bothering to exchange any fire with the target whatsoever. Woo, there goes Gibson again, hop hopping about like a killer rabbit. And meanwhile, oh blessed day, for the first time we have a soldier actually bothering to take aim. Well, kind of bothering to take aim. Uh, but of course, naturally, he's beaten on the draw by a child whose shot once again is both perfectly aimed and manages to send the soldier flying backwards like he was hit by a truck. 
In response the British fire another volley in which the majority of them aren't even trying to aim. One of them has his eyes closed, one's looking in the clear opposite direction, and one man is aiming for the birds while giving himself a face full of powder flash in the process. Wait, is that... I think it's the same guy as last time. Man, he's, he's a glutton for punishment, that extra. And I don't even know what the heck this guy in the corner is doing, although his musket does misfire. Oh, but look, he gives a little wiggle to, like, pretend that it did fire. Oh, good heavens. And because the British are firing volleys, Gibson once again has time to bunny hop over to a new position. And of course, during that process, despite the fact that all the soldiers were looking at where he was and could probably see him do so, they still managed to somehow lose the target and not realize that he changed over to a new position. Of course, if the soldiers were doing this as I recommended, and as, you know, would be second-hand nature to literally any of them by this point, if they were firing by files, half of that section would always be loaded, and the minute he jumps out into the open field like that, Gibson would be blown away by, like, four or five muskets at the same time. Well, he's magically already reloaded and takes another perfect shot, while the soldiers may as well be firing at a brick wall. Hop, hop, hop again, and we have more shots of the British not being able to hit a blasted thing, even though for the first time Gibson is clearly exposed and the soldiers are at least trying to aim at him. Still doesn't work, four men take shots and they don't even graze the guy. They're literally just shooting at the dirt instead of waiting for him to, you know, actually reappear. This is just getting ridiculous. You get my point by now, I think it's time for a montage. <laughs> It's just, it's just so silly. I mean, they're about to actually maybe pull off a shot, but then deus ex anti-semite, blah, 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 and they change their targets. Why? It, I mean, are, are they not, these are experienced veteran soldiers. Are they not used to hearing a scream in combat? Like, literally, they're about to take their shot, but then someone shouts, shouting, Oh, th that never happens in an active combat situation. Whoop! What? And then you have another soldier who might actually pull off a shot because Gibson is running into closer range, but Deus Ex Ledger, the son, happens to notice just in time and is also conveniently poorly restrained enough to just tackle the soldier who wasn't paying any attention, once again saving the day. Meanwhile, Gibson's closing in with this weird, like, like, boxer pose he's got going on there. I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe that's some sort of fighting technique when you have, like, a tomahawk and a knife. I, I don't know. But regardless, of course, it's ridiculous that he's doing this at all. I mean, he's sacrificing the advantage that he seemed, for whatever odd reason, to have in the woods. It's like, I guess maybe the trees were, like, magical. They were providing some sort of a force field to where he couldn't get hit. But he was doing well in the trees. He was, you know, in that firefight, taking out pretty much the entire company all on his own. So why is he now sacrificing the advantage that he had to, you know, leave behind all the fire locks, which he was even, he was reloading the things pretty quickly. That, that doesn't seem to be a problem for him. He's leaving all that behind, going in with two very short-range melee weapons against men who are younger than he is, more recently have had combat experience than him, and who are using muskets with bayonets, a longer reach weapon, and again, to say nothing about how they outnumber him, so they're going to be able to close in in a group and, you know, take care of him pretty quickly. At least, so you would think. So Boxer Mal is coming in for the old one-two, a tomahawk in one hand and a knife in the other. Now, these are two very up-close and personal weapons. But he's going up against a trained professional with an awful lot more reach. You know, they may call it the short land pattern musket, but that gun-turned-spear is still well over five feet long with its bayonet attached. So naturally, with every possible advantage in his court, what does the Brit do? He swings it like a bat. He flipping takes his bayonet, a weapon that is so obviously meant for thrusting, 
and he swings it wildly around like a toddler with a stick. This soldier isn't just bad at his job. He's making mishandling his arms like an art and into a science is what he's doing. He's even telegraphing his attack. You know, he's like winding up for it. He's telegraphing worse than a Dark Souls boss. At this point, this is basically just suicide by protagonist is what this is. So how very shocking that this attack, which even if it did hit Gibson, honestly wouldn't have done all too much, is easily countered and the man is dispatched. And not just in a, in, in a clear and quick blow to the head or to the chest. Oh, no, 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 no. The so-called hero has to have fun with it first. A, a little bit of spinning around and, and, and flourishing, of course. Maybe the worst thing here is that even Gibson's counter doesn't really make any sense. The musket was nowhere near him, but rather than letting it soar past harmlessly, he decides he has to be cooler. He catches it midair with the tomahawk, just rips it out of the soldier's arms like the soldier was a child, and then slices his throat before also tomahawking him in the back as if the throat slicing wouldn't have done the job on its own. And meanwhile, what are the other redcoats doing during all this? You know, during this prime time to just step in and shoot or stab him while he's putting on his little show, twirling all around and thwacking away with the, with the, with the tomahawk and everything? Well, naturally, one of them is busy knocking the sun to the ground, even though he was already tied up, so you only really had to just step a few feet away from him and then shoot Mel Gibson, but anyways... Oh, oh, and then we get the real all-star. Remember the thing that the first guy tried to do that it, it didn't really work like at all? Uh, the thing that you'd have to be a total buffoon to ever think would even stand a chance against an enemy? Uh, that literally surrenders every advantage that the bayonet has over the tomahawk, you know, that thing? All right, folks, here comes the wind up and the swing. Ooh, and that's a bad miss. Man, I mean, who could have guessed that that wouldn't have worked? I mean, you know, except for literally anyone who's ever held a weapon in their entire life. And as if that isn't bad enough, look at what happens afterwards now. Rather than responding with, well, quite frankly, anything at all, the soldier stands there for a bit, probably confused at how Gibson isn't cut in two like the animu taught him would happen. <laughs> before gently moving his musket forward, specifically into position for Gibson to then knock it aside. Is there a combat version of a straw man? Because I think we found it here, folks. So then you'd think now that with this perfectly open position against an unarmed and dazed opponent, uh, Gibson could dispatch him uh, before moving on to the next target, who is presumably just, I guess, vibing in the corner waiting for his turn to fight as well. Well, of course not. He has to play with his food first. He slices at either the soldier's chest or his neck, one of the two, uh, twice. Then he tomahawks the back of his leg. Which honestly seems to serve zero actual function beyond crippling the soldier, giving him a little bit of extra pain before he dies. And then finally tomahawks him across the face. The crowd goes wild. Once again, Mel Gibson making America something or other. Then, as we see a soldier actually aiming his shot, something that's deeply uncommon in this film, well, conveniently again, the son is able to tackle him to the ground so the kids can keep up with their little firefight. Oh, yeah, of course, the kids in the other half of this force are still just exchanging pot shots back and forth. There's literally a wagon right next to you. You can use it for cover. Why are these men just standing there trading shots away? They haven't hit a thing, and the kids have been literally perfectly accurate this entire time. Wouldn't it be pretty common sense? Even if these guys weren't veterans, even if they weren't professionals, you'd think it'd be common sense to, I don't know, try and change something up a little bit instead of just standing there and keeping on... Good heavens. And so it's daddy to the rescue as this soldier, reloading in his laughably silly and very long way, doesn't even notice the madman charging. Well, not until the last second, anyways. <laughs> Look at his face. Look, it's just, it's so bad. And rather than Gibson, you know, slicing at the enemy who's just standing there, completely unaware and unresponsive, instead he just slams into the guy, throws his musket aside in the process, before carrying on to the next one, who by now has had ample time to prepare and respond appropriately, but who also just ever so conveniently happens to be the only soldier in this entire scene without a bayonet. Why? They never cover that. It's kind of like the uh, disappearing knife from Star Wars. 
So instead, he has to hang back and try and shoot Gibson, but even his trigger finger just isn't quick enough as Gibson easily just knocks the gun aside, conveniently just as another man is coming around the corner to get blasted by his ally. I mean, this is the kind of plot contrivance I would expect of Star Wars. You can almost hear the, the campy music and the Wilhelm screen in the background. To see Gibson dispatch two more soldiers again as if it were absolutely nothing and with plenty of entirely unnecessary motions thrown in. I mean, look at this frame. Gibson is here perfectly positioned to just thwack the guy in the back, which would in turn give him just enough time to deal with the second man who is beginning to get up to his left. But instead, he spins around backwards for no discernible reason, trips the guy before, get this, he hits him on the ground then bounces up, changes positions like he's dancing or something, before hitting the poor guy again, and all just in time naturally for that second soldier to finally be getting back up to his feet, perfectly positioned for Gibson's next blow, and we have the wind up and the swing! Ooh, that, that was, that was and then, of course, we're going to get the classic tomahawk scene, but not before. Haha, -ha, surprise! Two more soldiers come rushing around the corner, ready for action. Where were... Where were these guys the entire time? What, what were they doing while Gibson was killing off all of their allies one by one at a time? They were just hanging out behind the wagon? Just waiting for a moment to look cool by running around the corner? Like, there were literally so many times that this guy was distracted when they could have just run out and taken him down easily. Stab, shoot, whatever. There were so many opportunities. And one of those guys, as he's running in, is holding his musket by the bayonet for some reason? What's he doing there? It was already fixed when he came around this corner. Was it getting unfixed somehow? Well, regardless of what that was supposed to be, naturally, on coming to his target, the soldier delicately nestles his musket into Gibson's easy grip. I mean, we, we don't want to accidentally stab the guy or something, do we? That'd be too realistic. For Gibson to then easily seize control of it, knock him aside before using the clubbed musket to knock the next man's piece out of his arms, Again, just amazingly convenient that these two guys didn't thrust, I don't know, at the same time coordinate their attack a little bit and skewer him. And dear lord, what's with these soldiers' awful grip on their muskets? I, it's like Gibson just barely touches the thing and they throw it out like it, like it turned into a snake on them or something. So a quick pop to the face, and again the man flies back like the butt of that musket was a springboard while Mel flips the musket around. And again, just how incredibly convenient that the weapon is already loaded at the full cock and ready to fire. Why those two soldiers didn't then just hang back and shoot Gibson at point-blank range when the musket was ready to go, who knows. And blasts the man, who's attempting to surrender by the way, in the face. Finally, at long last, we come to the hostage situation, but that too is taken care of pretty quickly. We can't have any actual drama, of course, any real tension. That'd get too close to making Gibson's character almost realistic instead of a veritable god. But anyways, I cover that bit, uh, as well as the part where he chases down a fleeing soldier before just mutilating him for no real reason. Uh, I cover all that in my previous Patriot review video, um, so you can go and watch it there, and I'll include the timestamps for that moment as well, because, um, well, that last video is almost as long as the original film was. Um, long story short, Benjamin Martin is a horribly written character and is just a horrible person. Shocking, I know. And if you believe it or not, we are still not finished, because apparently, much like our protagonist, I just don't know when to stop with the mutilation of a helpless victim. So let's go through a few more of these little inconsistencies and nonsensicalities. For example, if you keep track of Gibson's motions throughout the scene as a whole, you begin to see that his entire approach pretty much has, like, zero merit. There's zero, like, proper actual planning behind it all, it seems. So, from the beginning, he takes his first shot with rifle number one. He then runs off with that same rifle and reloads it before firing it a second time. He then abandons that rifle, you can see he's empty-handed here when he's bunny-hopping away, to pick up a second rifle that's sitting propped up against a different tree. He fires that rifle once before dropping it also, then swinging back to the first rifle, which he then reloads it and fires it a third time. Then he drops it again before running to a different position. 
he just kind of sits there in that other position for a second, then he jumps back out again going the opposite direction, firing his pistol as he does, and that's when he decides to rush into melee. Which, incidentally, he fires his pistol while, you know, while moving across that jagged, rough terrain, and he does it with perfect accuracy, and, and he takes out this soldier who's just sitting on the cart, like, he hasn't moved at all, he hasn't done anything, he's just been vibing there while men are dying all around him, while his convoy is under attack, he's just sitting there, like, what? As it is, he shouldn't even be there, because you know, it shouldn't even be a soldier driving the wagon, I mean to say. Uh, it should probably be a civilian contractor, but uh, that as well is another topic for another time. Long story short, soldiers could sometimes drive wagons, but it was preferred to have civilians do that sort of job, so you could have soldiers, you know, doing soldier things. Either way, soldier, or civilian, whoever, doesn't really make any sense for him to just be sitting there. Maybe he was deaf and blind and dumb. So by the end of it, he fires rifle number one three times, rifle number two only once, and a pistol once. He also changes position, i.e. he jumps right out of cover with pretty clear shots on him, at least five different times. The only reason that he's able to get away with honestly any of this is because the army is being portrayed as totally incapable. Even if we just accept that all of this company's officers were taken out on the first few shots and none of them had any time whatsoever to issue any commands to the men, you still have non-commissioned officers who'd be able to take charge, even the basic initiative of the private soldiers themselves who should be able to deal with this situation. Again, by this point in the war, these men are veterans, they're experienced soldiers, and this kind of fighting would have been something that they had done a lot of by this point. This entire scene could have been wrapped up in a quarter, probably, of the time, and if it made any sense at all, with a very different result. I mean, we see throughout the entire scene, the men are taking their time to form up in their close ranks, and they're taking their time to fire off individual volleys and reload, all that sort of thing. They have time. It's not like it, you know, immediately descended into pure chaos. They have time to make arrangements. Uh, so all that they really needed to say, for anyone, again, for the captain, for a lieutenant, an ensign, sergeant, corporal, anyone could have said these few simple words and the scene would have been pretty much over. Company form in open order. First platoon left face, second platoon to the right, firing by files. And, and that's it. That, that, that's, that's all they had to say. The British would have had their force split into two at that point, widely spaced, facing in both directions, with half of each platoon, so eh, probably, you know, say, five to seven muskets, at any given time, loaded and ready to fire, again, in both directions. You know, one of those kids pops his head up to try and take a pot shot, bam, blown away, five muskets, volleyed, you know, right on his exact position. Um, the dreaded ghost tries to bunny hop into another section, you know, from one tree to another. Uh, he's riddled with shot on the first attempt, or at the very least, if he's really lucky, he's blown away on the second attempt when the soldiers can locate precisely where it is and have a few muskets pointed on either side of the tree. Uh, maybe a few moments of silence follow. The men are a little confused, like, wait, we only killed three of them. Where, where are all the rest? Uh, before eventually uh, they, they maybe go to check, they realize, wow, these morons actually tried to attack us with one man and two children. Um, you know, they form themselves back up, maybe, you know, give a little tease to, um, you know, to, to the prisoner because his father was so stupid. They march on and, um, you know, that's the end of it. Maybe they can convince the sergeant that that should count as their marksmanship exercise for the month. And I'm sure that there are plenty of other options the British could have gone for here as well. That's just the first one that happened to come to my mind. Uh, Say, for example, after the first shot is fired, you have half the force exchanging fire at the enemy while the other half fixes bayonets, well, actually they're already fixed, just pushes into the woods. Maybe it wouldn't have worked against Gibson because he's, you know, a god, but in any realistic situation where these are the starting conditions, that would have ended the situation pretty quickly. Uh, or what about they actually decide to use some cover? Say some of the soldiers reload behind the wagons or ducking themselves behind that ridge that's just to the right there beneath the road. And heck, that might even be a little bit much to say that you'd need that much of a collective brain, because if the soldiers even bothered to try and aim their muskets, like I said, they could have taken the targets out pretty quickly. Or at the very least, Mel Gibson, when he's jumping and hopping around all over the place, he would have been pretty easy to take out. Maybe the kids took a little bit longer, but something tells me you shoot the dad, the two kids aren't going to last very long either. I mean, I'm an awful shot, but, you know, after what limited experience with live shooting I've had, even I could take out a man-sized target when it's that close up, I think. Heck, probably even a lot further out than that, even.
there we have it. At long last, I'm sorry that it took so long to get to, but I, I hope it was worth the wait, or at least some of the wait. Um, the next one, and oh, there shall be a next one, um, won't take anywhere near so long. Um, although, to be fair, uh, I, can, I can make that promise pretty easily because so long as it's less than a year, it, it, you know, it's still being faster. Anyways, well anyways, there are an awful lot of things to talk about with this film. Um, I, I have a pretty massive Word document, I, I should probably gesture here because this is where my computer is, I have a pretty big Word document of, of different topics to talk about. Everything from, I, I, mean, I mean, the uniforms, uh, the, the, the drill being god-awful, um, things like the politics in, in the film, how the politics is portrayed, uh, even actually the film's portrayal of women, which is just... It, it's something else. Um, but naturally as well, I'm always looking for more ideas that maybe I haven't caught on any of my numerous viewings. Um, this is a glorious crusade, my friends, against Farbury, and it shall not end until at least the vast majority of things have been talked about. I don't care how long it takes, and oh boy, it's taken a while. So if there are any particular subjects that you would like to see talked about, uh, then please do let me know in the comments section down below. And of course, if you enjoyed the video, then I would appreciate you leaving it a like as well. This video was made in support of the Native Oak. If you'd like to find out more about our educational mission, you can visit us at nativeoak.org. This video was only made possible thanks to our ever-beneficent membership on Patreon.com, and also, of course, by our generous sponsors, uh, Sp uh, Squarespace and Magic Spoon. Thank you all for watching, and of course, until the next time, my dear viewer, I am and I shall remain your most humble and obedient of servants. <laughs>